welcome the online participants who are joining us. I see we already have 18 uh, and, go, and, and rising. So welcome to this uh, webinar and it's, uh, it's Brown Bag Lunch on reforesting our world with children for millennia. Today we have at the front our two speakers. Uh, one is Professor Kazuya Fujiwara. She's uh, Professor Emeritus of Yokohama National University. She was a student of uh, Professor Miyawaki who started the model of Miyawaki Forest, which is our focus today. We also have with us Professor Edwin Box. He's a professor of physical geography and ecology at the University of Georgia. I believe he's also Professor Emeritus. Um, professor. It's a long story. I'm All right. Sorry, but they didn't let me emerge. <laughs> <laughs> right. So he's from professor. He's from the University of Georgia and has worked very closely since 1983 with the Miyawaki team, Miyawaki Forest team. Uh, also at the front are my colleagues Abd Salam Vilali, who's uh, our information management officer. He joined us recently. So for those who haven't met him, um, welcome, uh, Abd Salam. And next to him is Song Kim, uh, who is working with the UNCCD. She's from Korea. She's working with the G20 team, communications team. And she will be the one, the two of them will be actually focusing on the Q&A. So this afternoon, let me just uh, explain how we will run through this agenda. Um, we will have introductions. Um, for, uh, we'll have in, initial presentations by Professor Elgin Box and Professor Kazuya Fujiwara. Professor Fujiwara will start with a presentation on, on the introduction of mi the Miyawaki technique, followed by Professor Elgin Box to speak about stable forests, what they are. I had never heard about stable forests before, so it will be an interesting dialogue and conversation about what those are. They have 20 minutes each, 15 to 20 minutes each. And then after that, we'll go to a question and answer session. We'll open the floor. We'll start with the people sitting around this table two questions and then two questions online and we'll go like that until uh, our time is over. At the end, um, hopefully, I also want to welcome our Deputy Executive Secretary, uh, Andrea Meza, for those who don't know her. She's sitting right next to me and thank you for joining us. Um, I hope at the end, if she's here, she'll also uh, add her voice. But if she's, I know she has a lot of things that she needs to do. So if she's not here with us at the very end, we just want to thank you for being with us at the start. So with that, um, because I promised the professors that I'm going to make this very short so that they can start uh, their presentations, I want to welcome you, Professor Fujiwara, to make your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction and uh, inviting and uh, giving us uh, the, um, talking about uh, Miyawaki Mini Forest. Um, first of all, can I have, first of all, I'd like to ask you, how many people know the Miyawaki Forest? Hand up. Only one. Okay, that's natural. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, this is a slide that shows a 50 year old forest by Miyawaki Method Forest. And um, it was 40, 30 centimeter or 40 centimeter seedlings planted 50 years ago. It became like this. So today, I'd like to talk why Miyawaki Forest is now. What is Miyawaki Forest? How to create a Miyawaki Forest? Let's create a Miyawaki School Forest with children for millennia. So last year, COP, last year? COP26 in Glasgow, they made five places by Miyawaki Forest. Then they said, so Miyawaki Forest will uh, give us CO2 storage more than commercial forest or uh, natural regeneration. So uh, this is old history of Japan. 100 years ago, uh, Japanese national just made the Meiji Shinjingu Shinto Shrine Forest. So now, 100 years like this, but uh, this is a uh, landscape architecture method. Uh, people transport a big, uh, doesn't have the, this one? No, sorry. No pointer. No pointer. Oh, no, okay. Uh, 
left hand, you, you can see the big trees. The, they transported the big trees and also plant the donation trees. And uh, along the forest succession, so at first plant the conifers and the smaller trees, but even smaller trees, you can see the big trees. Then nowadays, and this kind of big forest, 100 years. But Miyaki made this kind. People gather and plant the small seedling saplings, 40 centimeters, 30 centimeters. Only eight years. You can see the forest and inside. Small Shinto shrine was located and also now a small stream, a stream there. And, and this uh, water is the best water in the uh, Konko, people said, and fire, uh, fire fly appeared in this month. Okay, why Miyake Horest now? So Miyake Horest are faster growing and this can store more CO2 than forest method. But not only that, uh, people can destroy stable forest for preventing severe calamities and animal habitats. And the Miyawaki forest can be planted by children, family, old people, handicapped people, and anybody. That's big and different. So Miyawaki got the natural forest has a complex function and prevention stabilization. It is different from the commercial forest and all prevention noise, fire, wind, several things. So when you see the <coughs> And dead tree, but the half tree alive. So mostly dead uh, root system. So this kind of plantation very much, but you make it with uh, seedlings, left hand, I think left, yeah, left hand. And the seedling of oak were planted at the wasted soil slope of constructed residence area. 1998. So with the two meter square and, and the 10 meter deep grass box, they, you see, they did, yeah, they bury it inside. So we uh, surveyed uh, 10 years later, uh, you can see seven meters tall oak forest there because uh, First time it was no nutrient, just to waste it to uh, soil. But uh, when we get into the grass box, we saw, we find, uh, we found uh, six meter deep top soil, top root. So it is important. So root system. When uh, you will see the uh, keyword that's pine in the field. So pine conifer occurs on the um, a steep slope or on the ridge. This is a natural habitat. And the broad-leaved tree, broad-leaved broad forest occurs the good uh, conditions. So left hand has uh, where conifer occurs, that the ecological optimum, we say. And uh, the middle is uh, high um, productivities and uh, phys physiological optima potential optimum too. So broad-leaved forest is uh, ecological optimum equal physical optimum, both. So therefore, stable uh, forest is important. When uh, we compare with the human impact and natural and substitute vegetation, you can see the human impact high, then so your uh, cultivated field or urban uh, areas, it is uh, can tolerate the uh, human impact, but natural risk and disaster, earthquake or fire, so the natural forest is highest strong, um, the highest strongness and the highest uh, naturalness. So they can tolerate natural disasters, but the human impact, they are very uh, weak. What is a Miyawaki forest? So uh, I will 
talk about history, character, method, result, target, and conclusion. Original idea of Miyawaki Forest, the, the original idea and the method for mini forest and envisioned by Akira Miyawaki came especially from outbound forest. And I saw it in Hanover mostly. He studied in Hanover and the Wilbert also, it restored the forest. Nowadays, it's very small amount in the Germany, Northern Germany. And the, uh, where he had studied the potential natural forest according to the Tuxen School of Phytosociology. He, then he added his agriculture experience. So 1928, 1928, he was born as a farmer's uh, uh, son. And uh, 45, so uh, Japanese archipelago completely destroyed in Tokyo, Nagasaki, Hiroshima, Nagasaki areas. In the end of World War, control under USA, such as education, Japanese constitution, etc. Then fuel transition also changed from the firewood to oil or gas. Miyawaki, first Miyawaki moved to high agriculture and the forestry school at the Bombing of Tokyo, you can see Okayama, he was born and that time he uh, uh, traveled to Tokyo, 800 kilometers. And once he moved, but uh, that uh, war time, he couldn't reach it. Then again, he went to the Japan seaside and to Tokyo. So he became graduate school student from 1952 and also the assistant of Yokohama National University. Then he got a chance to go to the uh, Germany, 1958 to 60. Then he come back, 1960s, he was very strict uh, protection of the natural forest, natural vegetation. So 1970s, the natural environment crisis very much, being of creation. Then he sought the not only um, protection the natural environment. You can see there uh, photos. So Tokyo Bay area, mostly only the um, factories, residences, known vegetation. So he sought uh, the creation of the natural forest now. So then began the Miyawaki forest. 1980 global environment crisis, 1990s, you can see the second uh, photos. We had the uh, earthquake in Kobe and the blue seat is just covered, uh, covered uh, roof. And then black part is green, evergreen trees. Evergreen trees just uh, um, defends the, the fires, middle of that band. So uh, we took helicopter and observed the areas. And also 2000, you can see 2000, um, Japanese uh, big earthquake in Tohoku region. We lost many people. <coughs> okay, Miyake Forest. At first, stable and the special selection of uh, species selection of from stable indigenous forest. So, what is stable indigenous forest? I think later Professor and uh, Agent Box will explain. And also soil preparation. Soil should be close to natural forest. And planting in this and and don't plant too deep and fix potted seedlings and dense mixed plantation. That's different from the uh, different from uh, commercial forest plantation or landscape plantation. Encourage so dense and mixed plantation. It's encourage competition and the coexistence among seedlings because uh, plant itself they have a different strategy for their growing. Get the photosynthesis and so some species. Um, tolerate under the shade. So then afterward, making mulching, plant suffering with local people, 
and children. So this is uh, just a uh, method. Yeah? You can see the good seeding with the root system and uh, plant. Okay. So based on these plantation, we had uh, a field survey in a whole uh, Japanese archipelago, 3,000 kilometers. And then each year we uh, published data and description. So typical, uh, uh, so based on this uh, data, uh, Professor Miyawaki and group made it uh, Miyake Forest. So this is uh, just our university, Yokohama National University, I retired 12 years ago already. That this green forest area is nothing. 1963, it was a uh, um, golf course, and you don't see any forest there. 1971, uh, National University bought land and uh, developed the uh, campus. You can see this is uh, my office was here. <clears throat> we planted seedling from the natural forest. Like Castanopsis evergreen quail expels here, and with uh, potato seeding with a well developed root system. Dense plantation, 1.5 to 2 saplings. Nowadays, uh, for the maintenance, when uh, dense plantation, then we don't need weeding so much. So, 2023, 40 years, then like this, you can see the forest. So even entrance, uh, 1979, for the 30 years anniversary of Yokohama uh, National University, um, Miyawaki just uh, proposed to restore the forest in the campus. So entrance is uh, nothing, just to uh, be around, then add the bamboo fence to stop soil collapse, and at the surface or onto the slope, dense planting of forest species, how small you can see. Then at the bulging with rice straw for the um, moisture, the keeping moisture and also and to make a nutrient by soil animals. And the, the, uh, after three years, nowadays entrance like this, this year, so preparation of planting site is very important. And choosing a natural indigenous species for creating the stable forest. Plantation method and the stages I, I will uh, give you. Uh, this is just a, a five meter width and 10 meter uh, length areas. Uh, Professor Matai, how many people know the Professor Matai from Kenya? Oh, only one, oh, three, one, three, four, five. Good, because she is a Nobel Prize sister, and uh, visited Professor Miyawaki to the Yokohama National University. So we made the um, cele uh, celebration plantation here, but uh, no space, then uh, we found a long area. So from uh, with uh, my graduate students in class, uh, students gather and uh, just uh, uh, proud uh, soil, give the uh, oxygen and soil, and you can see flat area becomes small mound. Then uh, I put the saplings, seedlings, and uh, so Professor Miyawaki right and left uh, as Professor Mag Wangari Matai, who is a uh, primary school student and uh, school, uh, university students and professors, they gather and plant. So after three years, then this year, already small forest important. Uh, even in uh, University of Nairobi, Chiromo campus, so we planted like this. So on the rocky area, uh, 2012 planted uh, with a student and Japanese volunteer, nowadays, Oh, people made a uh, wedding ceremony here, <laughs> enjoying. And uh, as a sponsor, uh, Mitsubishi Corporation 
told us to make a forest in flooding area. It's difficult because the soil was very hot and no uh, oxygen. So then I, I guided to make a mound there. So put the branches and the weeds inside. See? Then planted the seedlings with students and workers. And Professor Miyawaki is uh, bottom of the slide, uh, marching. So nowadays, you can see the forest, and we cannot see the surrounding areas. Even uh, highway is next to university. So participants uh, with the students and and local organizers, local people, it is very important key. So what's the result? Newcomer soil development, temperature control, carbon dioxide, dioxide uh, fixation. Uh, we did in the Yokohama National University areas. So this forest, you can see the mines, soil mines. You can see the um, black spot, it is uh, uh, Drop to leaves humbug. So mines decompose the blocking, uh, hum, uh, drop the leaves, and then uh, be, so bacteria decompose it for their nutrient. Therefore, um, drop the leaves very important. So we surveyed. Uh, what kind of the species come back with the plants, harvestious plants? It is uh, uh, came from the birds. And how many species can could survive? It, this is a five five to five square meters. Yes. One um, okay. One minute. Thank okay. you. Okay. Sixty percent of the trees and temperature three Celsius different and. Uh, Left as max um, max temperature and um, minimum temperature. It is three Celsius higher than uh, three Celsius cooler than uh, residence area in summer, and three Celsius warmer than the surrounding areas. So even carbon uh, storage is higher. So we plant uh, natural species middle and also. Uh, we plant uh, good-looking uh, shrubs for the surrounding areas, so people enjoy surrounding areas. How much did so you can see good health, quality education, several uh, de developing uh, sustainable developing goals. So we have the Miyawaki Forest in Japanese archipelago and in the world, but. Uh, Europe is not yet so much. Only Turkey we have. You see the tropical forest in Malaysia. Already, Sarawak area has such kind of forest in University uh, Malaysia. And also, Shishan Banner, that granite area, we, we had the four year plantation. And in Turkey, 2022, with the student planted area, it's become like that. So seedling planting with family member is fun and strengths family ties and societies. So let's rest reforest indigenous forest with children for millennia. And thank you very much for your participating in this lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fujiwara. As we prepare the next presentation, I just wanted to invite the uh, online um, participants who are here nearly 70 to put in their questions in the Q&A section, and then we'll be able to take those questions and answers at the very end. Uh, and for you, just prepare them and we'll do it as soon as Professor Box is done. So welcome, Professor Box. Thank you. Thank you. I'm right. I'm right handed, so I like to stand on this side. Mm -hmm. It's work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, Professor Fujiwara has told you a little bit about what uh, Miyawaki forests are, and I'd like to talk a little bit about what forests are, how they work, and a little bit about 
how they store carbon and a little bit about stability. And so um, what's the basic idea of a Miyawaki forest? The, uh, the, the basic idea is to go quickly, as quickly as possible, to a stable, mature forest using the species that would be the canopy of a long-term mature forest. So we're not going through successional stages. We're going directly to those climax species. Well, a problem with that is they're, they're rather demanding. They're sensitive. They don't grow in just bare land. And so you have to prepare a site well very first. And so um, th there's a bit of an initial cost in a Miyawaki forest. But after that, uh, the management uh, becomes very minor. So the basic idea, native species, of course, uh, canopy species, but potential uh, long-term canopy species, planting them densely, planting them from pot-grown seedlings. This requires a little initial effort and cost to prepare them. Preparing the site costs some money, uh, and then mulching uh, afterwards to prevent weeds from coming in and let them get a good start in life. Okay, we talked a little bit about planting the seedlings. I'm going to have to skip some of these slides because I don't have uh, very much time. Um, I think you've seen enough planting of, of the forest. But um, okay, what is a forest and how does it work? Uh, a forest is not just a bunch of trees. It's a relatively tall stand of trees that has a closed canopy. That means the crowns of the trees are touching or overlapping. That means then that it has a shady understory. And the canopy may be closed, but the understory, because it's shady, not enough light for many plants to grow, because it's shady, it's fairly easy to walk through. And a forest also has to be large enough to large enough in area that it has a, an interior so that you know light that's coming in from the side, we call it edge effect, doesn't penetrate all the way through. Um, canopy and understory. The canopy is a sun environment. The understory is a shade environment. The trees that are in the canopy of a mature forest had to grow up in the understory. That means they had to be shade tolerant. And as it turns out, the, the trees that you want in the canopy of a mature forest will turn out to be the most shade tolerant tall trees in that area. And that, those are the ones that you want to plant. You can tell that they're shade tolerant because they have very dark green leaves. The greater density of chlorophyll for functioning in a shady environment, as well as in the sunlight. This happens to be a tropical rainforest tree uh, with a nice little drip tip on it. But um, the same thing you would find in the warm temperate regions where evergreen broadleaf forests are, are uh, possible is in the southern half of Japan. Uh, if you come to Europe or most of my country, uh, east, especially the eastern U.S., we have deciduous forests because the winter's too cold. Well, well, Milwaukee forest will still work, but it requires a little bit more preparation. Okay, how does the forest work? Well, there are three main processes involved here, and I've tried to color code them here on this rather crude diagram. In blue, photosynthesis. This is the process that takes carbon out of the atmosphere, CO2 in particular, out of the atmosphere and puts it in vegetation. The other two in red, though, are uh, very important. Uh, respiration, which sounds like breathing, well, that's exactly what it is. It's the basic maintenance process of plants, and it, it uses up the stored carbon and releases it back to the atmosphere as CO2. D is the decomposition of the dead organic matter, which also releases CO2. So if you're going to have uh, an area of the landscape that's in uh, equilibrium with the atmosphere, then all three of these have to be in balance over the course of a year. If photosynthesis is greater than the other two, which is usually the case during the peak growing season, then you have a, um, a net, what we call a carbon sink. And so carbon can be stored in the vegetation. But suppose, suppose it's winter, or suppose it's a tropical dry season. Photosynthesis is almost zero, but the other two processes continue, maybe at lower rates because the temperature is lower, but they continue. And so then you have a carbon source region. We'll come back to that one eventually. Um, in the development of a forest, 
Uh, trees, when they're young, produce their leaf area, a canopy, fairly quickly, early part of um, their lifespans. The total amount of biomass accumulates gradually over the course of time. And of course, this accumulation is primarily wood. Most of the leaves are there and the amount of foliage doesn't change a lot. Okay, why does a forest stop growing? It stops growing when the um, energy used to maintain that increasing biomass catches up with the photosynthetic capacity. So the respiration, in other words, the maintenance process of all that biomass, when that catches up with the photosynthetic capacity, then there's no more possibility for net growth and the forest growth kind of plateaus, stops growing, and you've got a presumably a fairly mature forest by that time. Well, in the course of this, we've got uh, what we call fast growing and, and slow growing species, the early stages of succession, if we were gonna go through all these stages, the, um, many of these are smaller uh, plants or trees They grow rapidly, but they're light demanding. Um, they have smaller seeds, they're good at wind dispersal, they're good at sending their seeds to, to colonize uh, new environments, but they have fairly short lifespans. Um, the trees that form a stable forest, of course, though, are uh, much slower growing. Think of an oak tree as an example. Uh, they have long lifespans. They're shade tolerant. Um, they're fewer. Uh, they have fewer fruits, but they're larger fruits, and they're dispersed fairly locally. Um, and these are the evergreen and deciduous trees, but the most shade tolerant ones. Okay, how, is, how far us actually grow up? This is a classic succession model. I think you're somewhat familiar with this. If you start with, with nothing like an old field, you know, you've got weeds that come in first, then maybe some small trees, usually pine trees here in the temperate zone. Then they're very light demanding. Then some other trees, some deciduous trees uh, that can grow up under the pine trees. And then the evergreen broadleaf trees. Well, in Europe, we'd have to stop with the deciduous trees, also where I live. But in southern Japan, you can go on to this last stage and get the evergreen broadleaf trees. They're the most shade tolerant. Anyway, uh, the end point is going to be what we call the potential natural vegetation. And um, we're trying to build a forest without going through that 50 to 100 year process. Why succession? Well, because each stage in succession, if you go through all those stages, it kind of prepares the environment, uh, makes the soil better, provides more shade, more humidity. It makes the conditions better so the next stage can come in. But we're trying to find a way to go all the way through this process without uh, going through all the stages. Okay, um, carbon storage. Or back to that same uh, sort of uh, diagram we had before. I've labeled it with CO2 and, and water and so on here. But where our three basic processes, photosynthesis, respiration, and the decomposition of the dead organic matter. And um, there's a seasonal cycle to this in most parts of the world as well. Um, well, back in the 1970s, this, this story kind of starts uh, in, in that we ha had measured uh, photosynthesis in enough places around the world that we could start making models uh, based on the climate uh, to, to estimate what the productivity capacity would be. And so here's this, this first map of uh, net productivity of vegetation there at the lower left. This was presented in 1971, and we could quantify it uh, by uh, latitudinal belts there. We don't need all this detail, but just to show you what we could do in the 70s. And then in the 80s, we added the other components of uh, the whole um, plant uh, carbon balance. We were able to simulate uh, gross production, the actual photosynthesis, respiration, decomposition, put it all together and, and get the balance. And we could do that also then. Again, I could do it by 10 degree latitudinal belts. And we found that uh, for the land areas of the world, the um, total GPP there, that's gross primary production, that's photosynthesis without the other processes. And we find that that's about, for the world total, that's about twice the net productivity, which is what we would have after respiration. And so this, uh, we, be, we began to put all these numbers together and get an idea of, of what the, bio, the global biotic uh, carbon budget would be like. As I said, there's a seasonal cycle here. And the, the graph you see there at the lower right is for a place in India, which has a, I chose that because it has a good strong wet season and dry season. And you can see here 
in the, in the summer, in the middle, July, suddenly the monsoon rain starts and everything becomes very productive. But in the winter, um, it's a dry season, and this middle curve right here represents the net of all those balances, the uh, production and the um, carbon lost in by decomposition and respiration. You can see here that the production actually becomes negative here. It's a, it's a carbon uh, source to the atmosphere during the, uh, during the winter season. Not all climates are quite that seasonal, but most climates have a, a good growing season and um, an off season. And the famous uh, sawtooth curve there at the upper left for uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which was first uh, measured starting about 1960. Why does it go up and down? Each, each year is one cycle up and down. Okay, tell me, the top of each cycle represents what, summer or winter? Winter, winter, because in winter, there's more CO2 given back to the atmosphere. Okay, um, carbon sequestration. In the 90s, this became popular to be talked about, um, the idea of storing carbon in trees. And uh, it became, you know, it became very much a political thing and a business thing, and, it, and basically it's a lot of talk. Uh, it's not all that realistic. Um, we had all those models of the basic processes. And we found that we could put all those together in a, in a single model and simulate how the trees would grow up. And so the map that you see here is an estimate based on the climate of the total potential carbon storage in land vegetation if we let the tree, the vegetation all grow up to its maximum. And the total amount of carbon that could be stored turned out to be about 1500 gigatons. G, G means 10 to the ninth power uh, tons of carbon. Okay, um, so that seems to be the total potential. Um, at the moment, we've got about 600 gigatons in current land vegetation and about 750, maybe it's up to 800 now, this is an old slide, um, in the atmosphere. Those two numbers are fairly similar, but what's the difference then between 1500 and 600? That's the 900. And so that's how much carbon we could put into land vegetation, if we were willing to abandon the planet and let everything grow up to natural, into natural forests. And we're not likely to do that. And so um, this whole idea of storing all our excess carbon in land vegetation, it's a hoax. You know that word? It means it, it doesn't work, but it helps. We can, put, we can store some carbon in land vegetation and it helps. It won't solve the problem completely, but it helps. Okay, I, maybe I can skip that one, except I just wanted to show that the amount of carbon in the ocean is actually much greater than the amount on land or in rocks or in the atmosphere. Uh, well, this is only part of the story. There are a lot of other sources of carbon to the atmosphere besides just burning fossil fuels. Um, deforestation, it was thought that over the last half of last century, about one third of all the carbon that was put into the atmosphere came from um, tropical deforestation. And the other two thirds from burning fossil fuels and things like that. Wildfires, and they're getting to be more and more of them all the time as, as the world gets uh, warmer. This is a major uh, source of carbon to the atmosphere because it burns up all that uh, vegetation, releases the carbon. It's just like fast decomposition. Um, land conversion, uh, other things. Uh, and of course, there's all this carbon that's stored in soil, especially in high latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere, Russia, Canada, for example. And with rising temperatures, some of this um, soil carbon becomes vulnerable to being oxidized and CO2 released to the atmosphere. And not only CO2, but, but uh, also uh, methane. There are a couple of jokers in all of this. One of them is methane, and the other, of course, is nuclear war. Uh, but the methane is the one that's, assuming that we don't get nuclear war, and methane is the one that's really of concern now because we're just starting to see how much methane is stored in the bottom of lakes and 
uh, oceans and in soils, especially at high latitudes, and how much of this can, can be released to the atmosphere. Maybe you've seen uh, the uh, pictures on TV of the guys in Russia going out in a boat in a lake, uh, lighting a match and holding it out over the water, and it burns. That's the methane that's being released from the bottom of lakes now because the temperature has gotten warmer. Uh, some of this that was stored in permafrost, now it's available to be released to the atmosphere. And this is important because per molecule, methane is 20 or 30 times as strong a greenhouse gas as CO2 is. And there are feedback cycles in all of this. There's a natural greenhouse. The atmosphere, you know, kind of keeps the planet uh, temperature regulated. If we didn't have the natural greenhouse, it'd be as cold as Mars. There's what we call the enhanced greenhouse is what we're getting now with more CO2 and methane being released by human activities. And then there's what we might call the self-amplifying greenhouse is what you get when all these feedbacks start to kick in. We know what some of these feedbacks are. Maybe the most familiar one is number one there, the ice albedo feedback. If you melt polar ice, the surface changes from white to dark. Suddenly it's absorbing sunlight instead of reflecting it. And so there's a, this is why with global warming, it's the polar regions that warm up fastest relative to what they were. Okay, um, well, there's the water vapor feedback. Water vapor, it turns out, and of course there's more of it in the atmosphere as the, as the world gets warmer, Water vapor is also actually a pretty good greenhouse gas. Um, there's a cloudiness feedback. With more water in the atmosphere, you get more clouds. Well, this one can go either way. You know, it can, it can um, absorb some of the outgoing Earth radiation, which we would rely on to keep the Earth uh, cool to balance the incoming sunlight. But clouds also reflect sunlight. So, you know, that one's kind of a, a mixed bag. We don't know. This is the most difficult thing to get right in the, in the global models. And then there's the decomposition feedback. With more warming, more things decompose faster. They release more CO2. With more CO2, you get more warming. You know, it's a feedback cycle. And then there's the methane feedback, which uh, is a very powerful one. Um, and it's, it's really just kicking in now. And it's one that hadn't really been... Uh, and, uh, considered quantitatively very much until 10 or 15 years ago, but now we're um, finding out how important it is. Um, and so all, all three of these lines actually are, are saying pretty much the same thing. It's just that one's for soil, one's for lakes, and, and the other's for the Arctic Ocean. And so in each case, um, more warming means more methane release. More methane release means more warming. You've got a fairly strong feedback cycle. And all of this is driven by human activities. Um, and there at the bottom, you see that taboo word that I'm not supposed to use. Nobody's supposed to use this word overpopulation anymore. But sorry, I'll, I'll say it. Okay. Um, how about local forests? Well, they're too small to be significant in the global scheme of things, in the global carbon balance. The, our best bet probably is some uh, technology, some big vacuum cleaner that can take CO2 out of the atmosphere. And people are working on this and making some progress at it. Uh, but local forests, of course, have other benefits uh, besides just storing carbon. And I'm, I've got a, several slides here. I'm going to go through them very quickly, but I think we know what many of these benefits are. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. But why plant trees? Well, um, there are lots of non-carbon benefits. Uh, Herman heat ions, you know, they, they ameliorate temperature extremes, they um, improve the air quality, they um, mitigate against ozone. Um, there are all kinds of, of things here. You can see some more. I think you're, you, you've seen, um, and you can find these things very quickly in the internet if you just look um, for them. Uh, we know what some of these uh, uh, things are. Urban environments in particular tend to have an urban heat island and um, vegetation will reduce the temperature extremes, as Professor Fujiwara says, make them warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer. Also, probably uh, a bit more humid, um, improve the uh, um, ability to handle uh, runoff from high precipitation events, uh, prevent flooding. Um, they also may uh, create their own weather to some extent. 
some some cities actually because of the cloud formation that's induced by industrial activities and and the warmer uh, atmosphere, they may create their own thunder thunderstorms, usually downwind somewhere. And of course, uh, mitigation of, of ozone, which is an unstable oxygen, uh, oxygen molecule, can be uh, harmful at low levels in, in cities in particular, but trees uh, can uh, reduce this ozone considerably. Okay, finally, what about stability? I haven't said very much about it yet. What do we mean by stability? Well, uh, as Professor Miyawaki, uh, as uh, Professor Fujiwara said, the Miyawaki forests in Japan are now about 50 years old, which means that we have uh, a record of how these things grew up, what they're going to be like at maturity, and maybe we're starting to see what whatever long-term problems there might be. Um, there are more than 400 such forests in Japan, as well as many in other parts of the world. The experience started in Japan with evergreen broadleaf forests. Um, the northern half of Japan is the region of deciduous forests, and more recently, they started planting deciduous forests in northern Japan and some other parts of the world, including a few in my country. Um, but uh, they're a little more problematic. Um, but even so, these forests still serve after even after 50 years as closed shady forests in built up urban settings, urban and industrial settings. Um, and they've been created in, in the tropics as well. Um, Professor Richard, I showed you some slides of these. I don't have time to say much about it. But stability means that you've got a tall, closed forest structure that lasts for many decades. That's what we mean by stability in this sense. And such uh, forests, even in maturity, may be able to regenerate naturally. You don't have to go in and replant a Miyawaki forest. Uh, there may be some uh, problems as they get older, but, and we haven't seen more than 50 years of this yet, so we don't know what they're gonna be like at 100 years, but so far they're doing pretty well. And they may be able to regenerate naturally from their own seed and from things that uh, birds and other um, critters may bring in. But stability, as we said before, requires the most shade tolerant local species in the canopy, species that cannot be shaded out, as we say, or displaced then by other trees, because any, uh, any other tree that comes in requires more light, so it can't come in. How to identify the best species usually requires local field work. Um, this particular picture was from Kenya, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you may need uh, local people to help with this. But if you don't have local people to help, um, look for the trees with the darkest green leaves. They're likely to be the most shade tolerant. Um, I'm out of time, so I, you can read that faster than I can say anything. And there's not, there's not much new in these last few sides anyway. Here are some typical um, internet um, portrayals of Milwaukee forests. Um, can you see anything in, the, can, you, can you tell what's missing in that? It's hard to, to read it quickly or get the idea, but over here in the lower right, the only thing that makes any mention at all of climax species. I looked at a lot of these things online, very few of them mention shade tolerance, but that's the key. Well, another thing to worry about, um, don't make your forest too small. If you do, you know, the edge effect goes all the way through. And if the edge effect goes all the way through, it's difficult, if not impossible, for the shade tolerance mechanism to operate to ensure stability. Okay, the Milwaukee strategy, we said, you know, short circuit succession, go directly to climax species, and things will go well if you, if you follow the rules. And you, we've said these before, so I don't have to go through that again. Why does it work? Well, because basically because you're using the climax species. This is somewhat repetitious anyway, but you do have to know the the um, local climax species, and you have to avoid uh, using um, fast growing species just because they're native. Just because you've got um, native species doesn't mean that you'll get a stable forest. Um, remember also that trees only produce oxygen and store carbon when they're actively growing. At maturity, they can hold that carbon, but once something happens to them, if they die or get cut or whatever, that carbon goes back to the atmosphere. Okay, finally, uh, created forests, however many benefits they have, um, they won't contribute greatly 
to carbon sequestration at global scale, but they have many benefits at local scale and at regional scale. And I think that's enough. Thank you. Probably it's more than enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think that is not working. Okay, it's it's. Oh. Thank you so much. So, um, as I said, we're going to start. Uh, I allowed them an extra five minutes each. Um, it means that we've eaten into our Q and A time. But I hope you're going to be patient with us for about five ten minutes, so that we still have our twenty minutes of Q and A. Even though our lunch is going to be a little shorter, um, I hope that this is going to be worth it. And after the Q and A, when we're having lunch, you will have a time to actually interact with them. So, what I'll do is we have seven questions that are on the. Uh, q and a um, i'm going to ask for at least one question and then we'll go to the online questions perhaps take those first and then come back to ours if you allow that uh, because we have more time to interact with them since they're here in person any questions from the floor yes uh Irke. Uh, thank you very much uh professors i think this uh presentation is very useful and helpful and it shows example of how it will take and what to do. And the example of Kenya, I think illustrates what is, has, has been done in Africa. My question relates to uh, some of the work UNCCD also is doing uh, to uh, restore the great green wall in uh, the arid dry countries uh, in the Sahel. And um, it started with like planting trees, but uh, it's moved into on how to really have it as a kind of integrated way to have trees, but people and the livelihood and how to really sustain it. Um, what I've seen, I would love to see what would be, for example, two or three key actions. I, you mentioned not fast grow, growing, uh, growing trees. Here we are not talking about dense forest, but uh, dry land forest, and uh, any tips or guidance will help uh, us move forward for this uh, almost more uh, several decades going on and still wanted to have something shadow, but also livelihood for the people. Thank you. Let me see okay. something quickly and then I'll let Professor Fujiwara answer. Something I should have said during the presentation, you can't grow a forest unless the climate permits it, unless the, the climate provides enough precipitation. And so there are lots of areas where a closed forest simply won't grow. You could plant the trees, but they'll die. But when people live in their town, uh, this town will have the forest because uh, people want to live in the good environmental condition areas. Therefore, for example, in a dry climate area like a desert area, so people live in the oasis area, it's a high groundwater area. High groundwater area is not big forest, but the small patches of the forest there. So that's case in a town, you can find some patches of the forest and use these kind of the trees and taking care of the seedling from the seeds and plant there. So you will have the uh, many ornamental species, but not all ornamental species, don't use ornaments. Ornamental species plant the surrounding areas, inside patches. So we should plant native species, indigenous species. So you can find there some part, even desert area, but you can go to oasis, then you can find it. Thank you. Um, Song and Absalom, maybe you can read out two questions that they can respond to. So uh, we've received two questions from online participants. First, um, could the Miyawaki approach be used in dry regions such as Saudi Arabia? And secondly, um, given the recent reports that link Miyawaki plantation methods to concerns about biodiversity, do you think that Miyawaki methods are effective at promoting biodiversity? Thank you. I'll answer for biodiversity. That can be done quickly. And you may have seen something on the ad for this uh, session. 
something about 100 times the biodiversity. Well, that's silly. No, it's not 100 times at all. Uh, but, you know, two or three times, maybe. Uh, yes. Uh, what, what, um, if you're comparing uh, a Milwaukee type forest or any kind of natural forest against a tree plantation, you know, pine plantation or eucalyptus plantation or something like that, there's an enormous difference in the number of species that are there. And so, indeed, the Milwaukee forests or, or other, um, you know, quasi-natural forests will promote a much higher level of biodiversity than you can get uh, from a, a tree plantation. Okay. Um, Professor Box said there are not so much differences, but, uh, for example, our campus or uh, factory areas, people made the forest, Milwaukee forest, with their um, paddy field or grassland together. Then, so factory area doesn't have uh, any uh, uh, big amount of uh, bird species, but the forest can hold bird species and uh, with the stream or grassland, then insect coming to the areas. So this case, uh, very urban area with concrete, yeah? so restore the forest, then it becomes the bird nest areas, nesting areas, and also with uh, some uh, water area. So insects are coming back. Yeah, so, so in that sense, you could indeed increase the biodiversity by a factor of 10 or more. Then, yeah, maybe insect will be. Yeah. yeah. One professor surveyed the mines in the uh, soil, so our area, only few mines, mites, mites, yeah. mites there, but it's similar to the um, coastal sand area, but in the forest, it, it is 10 times yeah. more. <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference. Um, you, you, they also asked a question about in a place like Saudi Arabia, which is not very different, I think, from what Birku was asking, but I think it's a different uh, ecosystem. Well, Saudi Arabia, of course, is a desert, um, more extreme even than, say, the Sahel region. And, yeah, you know, the drier it is, the more difficult it, it's going to become. You've got to get the water. If you're going to try to grow trees, you have to get the water from somewhere. Uh, the climate's not going to give it to you. But if if it can, if it if you can bring water in somehow, I, I was amazed when we were in the uh, in a desert region in China once years ago and saw how they had an ingenious system of bringing in water from surrounding mountains for many kilometers out into a flattened flat uh, valley, and you know they could grow crops there. There was hardly any rainfall, but if you can do something like that, then of course you've got water for a for a forest. Forests will use a lot of water, though. They'll use more water than crops will. Okay. Um, in the room, questions? Okay. Do you have any more questions online? So, um, we've received other two questions. So, um, is Miyawaki approach guaranteed to work? What are its limitations? Secondly, is it feasible to implement Miyawaki forest in rural areas? Well, I would say that um, I'd say a Milwaukee forest is pretty likely to work for uh, climates that are wet enough. Uh, one of the limitations of a Milwaukee forest, though, is the initial cost, because you you do ha you do have to prepare a site. You do have to have somebody prepare all these saplings that you're going to plant, and you know this is going to cost a little bit of money. Once the thing is planted. There may be some requirements of maintenance for up to about three years. After that, if it's done right, it pretty much maintains itself and it doesn't cost anything anymore. I think they did a study in Japan and found that um, if you take a long enough period of time, 10 years or more, um, the amount of money you save after no more maintenance is required, the amount of money you save is actually more than the initial cost would have been. Um, there is a study in the Amazon area. So people planted the Miyawaki method and also the old method at the interval very much and taking care each seedlings 10 years or 20 years. 
But <clears throat> Miyake method, just three years, sometimes two years in the topics, reading, competition for the right. So just to maintain the two or three years um, for the competition, then later, nothing. So they maintain themselves and grow themselves in the also tolerate under the shade. So they can maintain themselves. That uh, um, Amazon people learned from the plantation uh, comparison. One other uh, potential limitation of uh, Miyawaki method would have to do with um, deciduous areas where you've got a dry season or a cold winter that where you can't have a permanent evergreen, broadleaf evergreen forest canopy. Well, they, they planted a lot of uh, deciduous forests in Japan and a few other places. And I found that this, this does seem to work. It just requires a little bit more care. You'll have a higher level of initial mortality with the uh, evergreen forests in Japan, the mo mortality level is, you know, one or two percent. I mean, it's it's almost negligible. But for the deciduous forests, it could be 10, 20 percent um, of the trees don't, that don't make it. And, um, you know, you, you just have to allow for the fact that the, the canopy is not there all the time. And there is a kind of a, a sensitive period there when the canopy in springtime has to um, uh, rebuild itself. Um, this require and and we don't have all the answers for this yet. This is this is why we like to come to Europe, because because here we can study how how a, what we have to do to make this work better for deciduous forests. Just additional, <clears throat> in United States, a company made the deciduous forest, and a surprise that in Japan, so northern part Hokkaido areas, it doesn't to. Do, grow up so fast. But the same year, three years, in the uh, United States, they grow very fast. And in China, this is forest region, is the middle of the areas, northern part. Also, dry deciduous forest grow very well. I don't know what's different from Japan and the United States or uh, China. They grow up very fast than Japanese deciduous forest. Uh, Hokkaido, you're talking Hokkaido, about. Yeah. yeah, it's cooler than in eastern yeah. than in eastern U.S. and China. It's cooler. Wow, that reason. <laughs> um, I think they also asked about the possibility of having Miyawaki forests in rural areas. Yeah, in rural areas. Well, this would seem to be a good idea. Um, yeah, certainly. There's no reason why. Miyawaki forests would have to be limited to cities or industrial areas. Certainly, they could be built in rural areas and could be built larger. If you've got the land and, and can prepare the site, and they've tried to do this in some uh, places outside Japan as well. And yeah, there's certainly no limitation there. Great. Okay, so uh, I know I have one question in yeah, here. Just a moment. Okay, sorry. So that rural area... When the developing country, it is very difficult. We did in Kenya, Mount to Mau area, it succeeded. But 2,800 uh, 2, meter areas, but local people cut down to use uh, firewood and construction. <laughs> After 10 years, yeah. we surprised. That's the problem. Right, livelihood questions. Okay, so I think we're getting to that point where people are getting very hangry and I don't want to get in, in, in between your food and uh, the next session. So I have one question here, um, if you can ask, and then we'll take the last ones there. Thank you. Um, my name is Matthias Barbach. I work here on the UN campus for the World Health Organization on environmental health. And uh, we're usually looking very much into all the environmental risks. But then urban nature is uh, recently a, a strong focus of many member states uh, being interested in the benefits of nature, especially greening cities is one of the, the key areas. And in that context, often what is raised uh, and also very much pushed by industry is the area of green roofs and green facades. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a, a strong interest in that area. I have been uh, always looking at that quite skeptical because I feel that it's still very modern buildings with steel and concrete and a lot of... Uh, uh, air conditioning systems so uh, I often felt this is more a little bit an ecological touch also helps with marketing I would like to hear your opinion on the 
green roofs because you're not going to go for climax vegetation in that situation, but it's still greening yeah. and it's adding to the green surface in the city. Is that a way to go or should we rather uh, look into completely different building styles, different materials and actually leave more space for real nature? What can be the contribution of well, this green facades and roofs? It's not either or. You can do both. And yeah, I, I would have nothing against uh, green facades and, and uh, green roofs. Uh, they may ameliorate temperature extremes for the buildings. Um, they may uh, ameliorate the reduce the temperature extremes to the areas around there. They, there's nothing wrong with with them. Um, but I'm I'm skeptical as you are about the about saying how good and how important they are. You know, it's a limited effect. But no reason not to do it, I think. As for our, for other um, other building materials, certainly, you know, buildings that are designed to uh, uh, capture sunlight, for example, to, and and hold energy for heating purposes, so that you don't have to have a big uh, heating or air conditioning system. Yeah, there are all there are all kinds of things like this. So it's it's not doing one or the other. Thank you. And so. Uh... One more question you have there? I think so. Let's take that one and then we'll close. So the last question would be, um, what is the size of the largest and smallest forest produced using the Miyawaki method? I don't know about the largest, but we saw one in the Netherlands, the forest. <laughs> <laughs> what okay. about the largest? Largest. Largest area? Yeah, largest area. <laughs> I don't know, that is there, there's a, uh, oh, every year, that's Borneo. That's oh, one campus, campus, yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the campus uh, in Malaysia. Yeah. yeah. So that was several, several hectares. Yeah. Um, or more, I can't remember how much, but yeah, they're, they're, they can't, no, this I suppose is one of the limitations of the methodology because as you say, um, there is an initial cost, and it it's proportional to the area that you're trying to plant, and so you can't uh, go too big unless you've got both the land and the money. Yeah, this case uh, we and uh, we made the rule. So plantation Miyawaki method area will grow very fast. So combination with uh, uh, with the forestry method like a two meter intervals. So then uh, we can plant two hectares, 10 hectares one year. So uh, big, for example, for, for, uh, 50 to 25 square meters uh, Miyawaki method area, then forestry method area, then also the line of Miyawaki method areas, this kind of combination makes the uh, reduce the cost and also wide area we can plant. So 10 hectares we did in uh, Mount area, Kenya, and the Karura forest also 10 hectares we did five years, two hectares, two hectares, because uh, initial cost problem. This uh, we use to foundation, therefore, how much we can use it, we did. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank our two speakers today for a very interesting dialogue. I think what we're looking for is this kind of dialogue where we can be skeptical and we want to explore those kinds of issues that we have with some of the things we've done. I have my issues with forests. I love them, but I have my issues with them. <laughs> so I have learned a few things today. And I think what is exciting for me is just how quickly they grow. I mean, within three, four years, um, they do grow. And uh, what's also encouraging for me is we are talking native forests, not the eucalyptus fast growing trees that also consume a lot of water. So thank you very much for the presentation. And I want to thank our on online audience that has stayed with us and for the questions that they have posed. But I also want to thank my colleagues. All of these are from the UN campus. Uh, none of them are outsiders. I just want to thank you for coming and, and, and learning with us as we explore these issues. So we will have um, some other, we're going to call them a different name. They're going to not be brown bag lunches um, because we want them to be dialogues. And so we thank you for your participation and we welcome you all to 
our lunch outside there. We also want to hear your feedback when you think that it's not that great. Please let us know. Um, if you haven't written your name down, please do so because we are sending out certificates and we know who is online, but we don't know who is here in person. So please fill out there.